Um, well, I had today planned to do something that was appropriate to the fact that we've got the Geneva Literary Festival here, and um, uh, I'd done um, quite a lot of stuff about reader response theory and stuff like that, about how we approach texts and what they mean. The bottom line would have been, if I'd been going to continue with that, because there were people here appropriate to that, what I would have said was, well, there's a lot of people out there who think that you give meaning to a text when you read it. It is the reader who puts meaning into the text. The text is ink on a page, they say, and then somebody comes along and they read it. Sam might read it and it'll mean X to Sam. Jim will read it, it'll mean Y to Jim. <laughs> Maybe Y to Jim. And then uh, Anne will come along and uh, although they are, you know, they know each other pretty well by now after all these years of marriage, um, Anne will read it and it'll mean Z to Anne. So what does it actually mean? Does it mean what Sam thinks or what Jim thinks or what Anne thinks? I'm really, you know, I'm kind of simplifying the whole deal here by quite a lot. Where is the meaning of the text? Is it with the person perceiving the meaning, putting meaning into it, or is it in the text itself? From the person who authored the text, yeah. And uh, we go through all sorts of things to try and find out what it was that the author intended when he gave us the text. And this is a case today. If, if we had been so minded, or whatever, um, we could have gone through this parable of the sower and, and looked in quite some detail at what Jesus thinks of reader response theory. Um, you don't want to do that. <laughs> so, so we ain't going to do that. We're going to look at it, but I'll be asking that question uh, from time to time. You know, what is our response to this? And, and, and what, um, yeah, what comes, what comes of that? There's a very famous situation with Humpty Dumpty and Alice through the looking glass. Do you, do you remember this? Um, this is it. Humpty Dumpty. It can't be anyone else. And he looks exactly like a giant egg. Young lady, it's not very nice to tell someone he looks like an egg. Some eggs are very beautiful, you know. Some, Some people have no more sense than a baby. <laughs> My name's Alice, sir. That's a stupid name. I may be stupid, sir, but don't you think it'd be a lot safer down here on the ground? The wall is very narrow. Of course I don't think so. Why, even if I did fall off, the king has promised He sent all of his horses and all of his men to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You've been snooping at doors, or you couldn't have known that. Oh, no. It's in a book of very famous nursery rhymes. What a beautiful butt you've got. Really? When a person doesn't know a cravat from a belt. <laughs> it's a cravat, child, and a very beautiful one, I might add. It's a present from the white king and queen. Really? Yes, really. They gave it to me for an unbirthday present just this past week. An unbirthday present? What's an unbirthday present? It's a present given when it isn't your birthday, of course. I like birthday presents best. You don't know what you're talking about. How many days are there in a year? 365. And how many birthdays do you have? One. And if you take one from 365, that means you can get 364 unbirthday presents. You see, dum-dum? Certainly. And only one for birthday presents, you know? Now there's glory for you. But I don't know what you mean by glory. Of course you don't, till I tell you. I mean, there's a nice knockdown argument for you. But glory doesn't mean a nice knockdown argument. When I use a word, it means just what I choose it to mean. Neither more, nor less. The question is whether you can make words mean so many different things. The question is which is to be master. That's all. Words. I have a temper. Hmm. Some words, particularly. Verbs, Whew, they're the proudest. Adjectives, you can do anything with, but not verbs. However, I can manage the whole lot of them. <laughs> Impenetrability, that's what I say. 
Would you please tell me what that word means? Now, you talk like a reasonable child. I meant by impenetrability that we've had enough of that subject. And it would be just as well if you'd mention what you mean to do next. As I suppose you don't mean to stop here all the rest of your life. That's a great deal to make one word mean. When I make a word do a lot of work like that, I always pay it extra. Do you know, Lewis Carroll was, was a professor of philosophy and maths at Oxford, and when he wrote Alice Through the Looking Glass and Alice in Wonderland, he was touching on a lot of philosophical discussion in the day, in and underneath all this entertaining conversation. And what he's getting at there is, what, can, what does a word mean? Does it mean what I can make it mean? Or does it mean what it was meant to mean in the first place by the person who used it and gave it meaning? And that's very much the issue that, that we're on here uh, with, with this parable. Okay? So the literary type is a parable. The thing about a parable is it tells a story, but it invites the reader into the situation to, 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 to enter into it and, and, and to respond. And, and response is definitely what a parable is looking for. It gives you a little enigma. Now, we're all in the sort of world where we think that if you want to communicate with somebody, what you do is you put it as clearly and as simply as possible so they can understand it straight away. Okay, that, that, that's okay for very simple communication. But when you've got big things to convey and important stuff to convey to people, you may need them to be thinking this over for a while. And Jesus puts stuff into parables so that people have to enter into it and they have to think about it. And they have to work out what's going on here and work out for themselves what it means. Work out what the author's getting at. That's why Jesus is using parables and, and he'll go on and say a bit more about that um, in a minute. Jesus comes with a message. Chapter 1, verse 15, he comes with a point that he needs to make. But he doesn't always make it in the easiest, simplest, most surface way because he wants people to enter into it and to respond from the heart to the message that's being conveyed. And that takes, you've got to get a bit deeper into a person for that to happen. So he uses this non-literal language, metaphor, comparisons without using like or as, you know. He's using parable in, in that sort of way. Lots of non-literal language. The thing about a parable is that it invites the reader or the hearer to enter into it and to respond to it and it aims to do that with the people that it's addressed to. So what we need to do to enter into the situation is to look at where that arises in, in life and where it arises in the bigger story. And the German theologians have got a fan, fantastic sort of expression for that. They say we must establish the Sitz im Leben, right? What is the situation in life of this account? The situation it was to address to, because Jesus is addressing that situation, and the Sitzimbericht, the, the, the place in the bigger story. Happy? Yeah, okay. That's easy. It's all easy. I'll tell you why. <laughs> the situation in life, the sits in Leben. The parable is addressed to who? To the readers of Mark's Gospel. Who's Mark's Gospel for? For me. <laughs> okay, you can have it as well. But originally, it's put together for Christians in Rome in a time of difficulty and persecution, yeah? So they're saying, here comes this message from Jesus, which is that the kingdom of God is at hand, repent and believe the gospel, and then he's calling people to him to go and preach the gospel to everybody. They're saying, why isn't this message immediately victorious and winning people over? Why is it then that we're getting into awful trouble for holding on to this gospel? We're just here, like good lads, trying to proclaim the incoming kingdom of God, and our life is getting a lot more complicated as a result, and people are not falling down and believing all around us. How do you account for that? Jesus tells the parable of the soils to that situation in life. Making sense? What about the situation in the story? It's in Bericht. Right, so what's been happening? is that Jesus has come, he's preached that kingdom, he's called these people to follow him, he's, he said, you're going to follow me and I'm going to make you fishers of men. You repent, you believe, and you become a fisher of men following me, because that's what I do. Okay? Off he goes and does it, and he starts showing the power of the king as he comes. So the power of the king has been shown in the miracles, and the message of the king has been shown in that he's saying, look, repent and believe the gospel, and people are doing it. And then he goes to a house which hasn't got a hole in the roof, until he gets there. And then these guys come along, make a hole in the roof, let somebody down through. And what Jesus does is he says to this guy, your sins are forgiven. You're paralysed, here is what you need, your sins are forgiven. 
And everybody objects, well, they don't. The religious people object and they say, you can't do that. Only God can forgive sin. And Jesus says, yep, but so that you may know, the Son of Man has authority on earth. The Son of Man, the figure from Daniel chapter 7, who sits on the throne of the ancient of days. Got that in your head? Yeah. That guy, so that he's, you know that he's got authority to forgive sins, get up and walk. Take your bed home. And he, famously, gets up, lifts his bed, goes home to prove it. Yeah? So Jesus is now saying, I am God on earth with authority to forgive sins. Immediately opposition breaks out. So the king is coming, his message is being proclaimed, it's been authenticated in all sorts of ways, but people are opposing the message. The parable is addressed to readers in Rome who are following that Jesus, who are finding it hard to deal with that. And it's in this place in the, the, the unfolding story of Jesus and what he's about where opposition is emerging against him and his preaching and resistance to the message, even though it's the message of the incoming king. Why are we in a position of coming here each week and saying, I've been able to share my faith this week, I've been able to do this, I've been able to do that, and people are not flooding into the kingdom of God. It's not just a problem that those folk have back there, it's a problem that we have here. We go out on a limb, we try and prove faithful, we share our faith with people, we do what we have to do. And it feels sometimes like somebody's sawing the limb off. To that situation, Jesus tells this parable. Okay, you've done that. Done that. <laughs> Get through the pages here, because, you know. Yeah, done that. Yeah, no, but that. That's what's happening in the, in the story, yeah? Opposition's broken out in those ways, and the parables are dealing with that. And we'll come back to the theme of opposition at the end. So to that situation, Jesus tells this parable. What parable? Here's the picture. It starts with Jesus crying out for attention. Listen, he says. You'd have thought if God had come to earth and was telling you that the kingdom of God was coming in, he wouldn't have to stand up and say, listen. But he does. He has to say, hey, hey, whoa, 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 stop there, pay attention. Listen. It's ended in a similar way in verse 9 with a twist in the tail. Whoever has ears to hear had better listen, it says in, T, in, in, in the, the Net Bible, an English translation, which is a really good translation. That's the point. If you've got ears, you better listen. But there are those who don't. No excuses, says Jesus. You've got ears. I've told you once. Once is enough. It is important, so now you better jolly listen. Enigmatic and unexplained though this parable is to the big crowd, open your ears, think about it, listen. So firstly, you've got one sower, okay? One sower does the whole job throughout the parable. The whole thing is down to him. He does the lot. One sower and one bag of seed. Well, I don't say bag, but one sort of seed. It's all the same. There's famous use of sower imagery in Jeremiah 31, where God is described as the sower, where the sowing process is God repopulating, devastated and depopulated Israel and Judah. The sowing is where God is repopulating his kingdom after disaster. Maybe that carries across something it does, something it doesn't. But you've got one sower, you've got one seed bag, and you've got three sowings of one seed. Well, four. What varies is nothing to do with the sower, is nothing to do with the seed. What varies is the crop, and why it varies is the seed that the, that the soil that the seed falls into. So here's the first sort of soil. Well, soil, it falls paratain hodon. It falls on the hodos. What is the hodos? It's what you put your car on to get here today. It's the roadway. Jesus has got a, an understanding of Palestinian agriculture. It's where he's getting this story from. He's well aware that what happened was that seed was scattered and then it was ploughed to cover it, to plough it in so that it could get cover and take root. So they prepared the soil. They came and they scattered the soil on it and then they ploughed it to cover the seed, to turn the, turn the soil over, yeah? Except you didn't go and plough over the bit that you're going to use to get in and out. Because if you do, you'll be up to your knees in, you know, you need your wellies and it won't be nice. So the edge of this, the field, right at the edge, that's where you go back and forth. That's where the field would get hard because you didn't plough it. You walked on it and you kept it as hard as you could. And the seed that falls there is going to remain available for consumption by birds. Just ask yourself quietly. If you were a first century Palestinian peasant sitting on the beach, listening to Jesus, describing that from the boat offshore, what are you thinking now? What sort of response do you think that picture is going to evoke in the hearer? 
Well, don't give too much time to that because there's another picture about to be painted and Jesus moves in very swiftly on. Here's another. It's obvious, isn't it? Here's another. Sowing the seed on stony ground. Metaphor number two. Another type of soil. Uh, I really don't want to turn this into a soil science lecture, right? Okay. But what you're dealing with here is topetrodes. It's ground, as verses 5b and 6 make clear, where the underlying rock comes really close to the surface. We've probably grown up with stony soil and we think of, you know, a nice bit of veg patch, but in it there's rocks, yeah? Pebbles, marbles, I don't know, um, gravel. Yeah? No. We're not talking about gravelly soil that has small stones distributed through it. We're talking about an impermeable slab of, of there was a calciferous outcrop just below the surface in large parts of Galilee. So just below the, the soil there's a slab of rock. So when the seed is sown there, there's an initial appearance, flamboyant success, flamboyant growth. But it's the outcome that Jesus emphasises, it's not a crop, because when the sun comes out brightly, there's not enough root growth to sustain the plant, which by this time of year has now grown up, and rapidly keels over under the pressure of the heat. The scorching heat burns it off. There's no root. So if you're on the beach, or if you're not in Jesus' audience at this point, but in Mark's readership, as a Christian living close to the persecuting authorities in Rome, because it's written for them, what's going to be your response to this element in the parable? You're thinking about the way you've been sharing the word of God. You're thinking about how you've been sowing God's word in the world. And you can think of people, perhaps you've rejoiced over, because they've shot up, but they haven't got the root. And when the heat comes on, the keel over. If you're prepared to commit to giving that some thought and you're going to attend to the detail, what are you going to get from it? It's a parable, you've got to go and think it over, but you'll have to do that later because a fresh soil type is immediately introduced into the story. Jesus is moving on. Another sort of uh, other seed fell among the thorns and they grew up and they choked it and it did not produce grain. It grew, you see, oh, it grew. It grew, but the ground hadn't been prepared properly. And there were bits of root left in it when they turned it over, you know, like you do with a rotavator and you chop it up and the weeds get, weeds get worse. Or, or they hadn't gone through and pulled all the old seeds out, you know, the old seed heads had been left in. And the seed goes into that old ground and there's a lot of competition. Too much competition from the weed seeds and the roots left in inadequately cleansed soil. So growth is choked off. Too much competition. Plant starves. No useful crop no fruitfulness no results the farmer is not looking for vegetative growth he's looking for a harvest yeah what are they going to make of that what is this going to be saying to them those people on the beach and those people in Rome it's not my read a response that accurately interprets this, is it? It's what the author intends them to see. And you can see there's a clear drift in all of this. There's a direction in, in the different sorts of soil where Jesus is going. Clear progression in what's being, being portrayed here. The first sowing never got started. We see that happening. We can kind of account for that a bit easier, can't we? The second started but died, but you can see it hadn't got properly started. The third started and survived, but deprived of nutrients and outcompeted, it produced no grain. It was fruitless. Can you see a progression? In the end, none of those three is of any value to the farmer. He is not looking for survival and appearance of life. He's looking for a harvest. There's none there. Now, we can't say how much seed fell into what sort of growing medium. We shouldn't be in a position to say, well, you expect a 25% hit rate from your evangelism. Uh, it's not like that. We don't know the scale of the operation, how much went where, and, and, and then, you know, we don't know how much was put on and all the rest of it. We certainly don't know how much seed was harvested or not harvested. You know, it's not like that. It's not a proportional thing. It's an illustrative thing. But now Jesus moves on again quickly, and he moves on quickly to paint the contrast. And he, he paints a contrast in, in linguistic tones you can easily miss in the English translation, because it says, other seed fell on good soil, produced grain, sprouted and growing. Some yielded 30 times as much, some 60, some 100 times. What happens is, the fate of each preceding sowing, you know, the, the rocky ground and the hard ground and the weedy ground and all the rest of it, it's described in the aorist, the simple past tense, a snapshot. Snapshot of past time. Simple past, been and gone. But the seeds which fell into good soil are the subject of an active sentence. Okay, it's a, it's a glaring thing. The verbs, verbs are in the imperfect, which is a past tense going on. 
and they're filled out by two present participles, ongoing action. Yeah? Are you with me? Are you really? You look at me as if to say, God, you're on another planet, what's the matter with you today? Well, yeah, okay, I am. Um, <laughs> this is a lasting situation. The, the other one is sort of been and gone stuff. This one is a, whoa, that carried on. Clear contrast to what's gone before. Here's a persistent situation, a persevering situation. Um, here's, here's a little infographic because this has been heavy and some of you like pictures, um, which is great. Uh, so, you know, you've got the path, yeah. You've got the stony ground, yeah. You've got the thorny ground, yeah. You've got the good soil. And there are these results. You've got the crows coming in, you see, to pick up. And you've got wilty plants and you've got thorns all choking it all out. And then you've got a harvest in bright colour, just to point the contrast. Because that's an ongoing situation, that one that's died and fallen off the perch. Okay. Four soils, four results, three fruitless and passing away, one fruitful and continuing. Readers, listeners are engaged. They've heard, they know this is set in a context of the preached word not bearing fruit, but rather being opposed. So, if you fill a room with people, with a piece of paper each and a pen each, and once the story's got to this point, you ask them to write down what the story is about, how many different answers are you going to get? I've been through it and I've been cheating because I've been unpacking it as I go along. I, Jesus didn't do that. He just threw it at them. You know, if you just threw it at people and all sat in the room, all these literary people for the weekend if they come, all together in one place, and give them a bit of paper and a pen because they like that sort of thing. If you did that and you said, right, what's it about? Well, I'd like to think it's about it. I believe and my feeling. Oh, when people start saying my feeling. Ooh. I feel, do you? <laughs> Stay there. Many of us know this story all too well, but we, we, even yet, and having gone through it, we would still get some significant variation in here on the theme of what it's really all about. And that's the problem with this reader response criticism idea, where I put my meaning into the text. You get it with C.S. Lewis. He was one of the early individual reader response people in, in, you know, in many ways. Even in those forms where interpretive communities are allowed to de determine validity interpretation, you get a variation between the communities. That's the thing about the Bible. A poem or a play or a novel may be there to help you get in touch with yourself, your emotions, your experiences, your past. But the Bible is there for a different purpose. To help you get in touch, not with your feelings, but with your God. And he's got something definite to say. And it's not a matter of playing on the strings of your emotions and, and stuff like that. It's a matter of communicating the truth of God that will save us. So, so what are they going to make of it? Will they carry anything of use beyond the immediate subjective reaction to the story? Should they? Jesus ever so helpfully engages that question. First of all, he talks about what the parables are for. When he was alone, those around him with the twelve, it's not an exclusive group, it's not just the twelve, there's a bunch of them, but these are the guys who've pushed on to know more about the Lord. They've gone back with him after the service. They want more. They're pursuing Jesus. Oh, well, the crowd has all gone home, they've gone for their tea and they're having a good chat about, oh, lovely sermon. You know, and, and then, these are the guys who want to pursue Jesus. They asked him about the parables and he said to them, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you. To who? to those who press on to know the Lord. But to those outside, who put themselves outside the group who are pressing on to seek the Lord, to them, everything is in parables. So that although they look, they may look but not see. And although they hear, they may hear but not understand, so they may not repent and be forgiven. They're not pressing on to know the Lord. Seek me and you'll find me, says the Lord, if you seek me with all your heart. If you don't, it's going to be entertainment. You can make it mean what you want it to mean. You're not interested in what he means it to mean. You're defining your meaning for yourself. You're out there somewhere. As long as you're doing that, you're not part of the in crowd and you're not going to know and you're not going to understand. You're not going to be saved. Until you're prepared to take his word of what he wants it for and take the message that he seeks to convey to your heart. Don't you understand this parable Jesus said to them? Oh, don't you? There's an allusion there to the prophet Isaiah, okay? Isaiah says this. Isaiah is there to call people back to God. And they don't want to listen to him. 
And Isaiah's in his call vision, you know, he's just been, and the other king Isaiah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up, his train, the train of his glory filled the temple. And there were angels all around, and they were crying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Yeah. And Isaiah is convicted, and he says, oh, oh, woe is me, too bad for me, I'm a man of unclean lips, I live in the midst of a people of unclean lips, but my eyes have seen the Lord! And he's taken with a vision. And an angel flies and brings a coal and purifies his lips coal from the altar of sacrifice purifies him he said go and tell these people listen continually but don't understand seek me you'll find me if you seek me with all your heart they're not wholehearted in seeking God listen don't understand look continually don't perceive by preaching make the hearts of these people calloused make their ears deaf and their eyes blind otherwise they might see with their eyes hear with their ears their hearts might understand they might repent and be healed and Jesus is applying that to the crowd he's been talking to from the boat as they line up on the beach it's those who pursue Jesus for the, for, for the sense and the purpose and for the message and for the meaning and to live in the light of what he says for them it's made plain Meaning is conditioned upon your response. Understanding is conditioned on your response. But it's not your response that gives the meaning to that message. Does that make sense? So. What on earth is the point of what you've been saying, Jesus? What on earth is it all about? When he was alone, those round him with the twelve asked him about the parables, and he said, The kingdom of the secret of the kingdom has been given to you, but to those outside everything's in parables. So let's go through it, he says. There's this path. Jesus is making clear to the dedicated followers who've stuck with him, not dispersed like the crowd, you're right to be thinking this. What interprets the parable's meaning is not the reader's response then, but the intention of the parable's author. It has a definite meaning, one clear, definite, objective meaning that the Lord, its author, can convey to them simply and easily. Their response is essential, but in fleshing out the parable's significance once they've understood the parable, rather than creating the parable's meaning. Jesus identifies the hard ground. We'll see, I'll show you what I mean now. He identifies the hard ground with those who hear the gospel, but it's snatched instantly away before anything good can happen with it. Now, if, if you're looking for what the parable means to you, as if you determine its meaning, then that's you. You're the hard ground. Because you're not looking for what he meant, you're looking at what you want from it. And people read the Bible like that. What can I get from it? Not what do you want to, what do you want to say to me from this. Does that make sense? The second response to the word of God is uh, the rocky ground. These are the ones sown on rocky ground. As soon as they hear the word, they receive it. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, fantastic. It's great. Yeah. Uh, but they have no root in themselves. They do not endure. They do not press on to seek the Lord the way this group around him is now doing. They shut themselves out of that group that understands. It, it, it's a response of short-lived commitment. No depth of root drawing its spiritual resources from Christ. Only the energy stored in, in the seed itself gets this plant off the ground. And in no time, the heat of the day scorches it off because it's got no roots to get more in. As soon as the pressure is exerted against that sort of inverted commas faith, it becomes apparent there are no roots in God there that are worth anything at all. Now this parable is not being interpreted by the hearer, this parable is now interpreting the hearer, isn't it? It's not that the hearer is unpacking what the parable means, it's the parable is unpacking what the, what the hearer means. Does, does that make sense to you that way around? The word of God is not being unpacked by the hearer, it's unpacking what's in the hearer's heart. Apostasy under pressure bears no fruit for the sower, and it's a relevant message for Mark's Roman readership. The question is, how will they hear and respond to that? And then there's this third soil type which produces foliar growth, but competition from weeds not cleared out before planting, they, t they, take, they take the place and they sap the strength of the plant, which stays fruitless, is ultimately choked. Others are sown among thorns. They hear the word, but worldly cares, the seductiveness of wealth, 
the desire for other com things come in and choke the word and it produces nothing there are there are thought words in there it's about attitude and thoughts engendered engendered by but not about the possession of wealth it's not the possession of wealth that's the problem it's the thinking that goes alongside having it does that make sense and then there's the good soil and that needs very little further explanation Jesus is painfully brief these are the ones sown on good soil they hear the word receive it bear fruit one thirty times as much one sixty one hundred you put one seed in you get thirty back you put one seed in you get sixty back you put one seed in you get a hundred back there's three categories in there there's varieties and levels and what do I mean um, amounts of productiveness in good soil but good soil is good soil and it produces fruit does that make sense See, the parable is actually interpreting the reader, and, and it's not the other way around, once you've grasped it and understood it, according to what he's trying to say with it. The parable is like a sounding board. Your response to it will not only show what you're made of, it'll show which category of soil for the gospel's good seed you've turned out to be. And every time we go out and share our faith with somebody, that's what happens. It interprets the person hearing it the reader's response does not determine what the parable means but determines what the phenomenon of the reader themselves signifies what do you signify are you good or poor so in which category does that make sense well I'm, I'm sure you're really grateful we didn't have anybody here that I'd have to go through all that reader response theory stuff with yeah I've, I've tried to sort of then come back and summarize it and put it in the level that, you know you get, you get things that occur in society at the sort of intellectuals level right and you've got all this clever philosophy stuff floating about and then without without having the same language or the same sort of without tracking it back you get this thing that happens at the folk level at, at normal everyday life level that's come from there but the link isn't made clear and we've got in our circle of acquaintance we've got people who think they're coming to the bible to make sense of it to put their meaning into what they're reading yeah this is why when we deal with people we share our faith with people we get the mixed response that we do and that mixed response is conditioned by all sorts of other things that get in the way to make sure that the soul doesn't actually find root and bear fruit hardened ground we know about that's easy we can recognize that we can become acclimatized to it the soil where the roots don't go deep enough and people spring up and then keel over when it gets tough that's a lot more difficult to take isn't it and then there's the weedy stuff the people who do come along and they do seem to make growth but they've got all sorts of other things going on in their life because the repentance Jesus calls for in 115 isn't thoroughgoing enough the weeds haven't been rooted out and then there's the good soil and some people seem to be so fruitful and some people just as faithful perhaps but not so we don't determine what the parable means in a sense the parable determines what we mean or rather what we signify what we amount to and the same is true with all those that we seek to share our faith with and the parable is written for our encouragement for the sort of situation in life it was written to and the situation in life that we have and it finds its place in the story of our experience the way it finds its place in the story of the experience that Jesus is spelling out Peter is spelling out through Mark in this gospel and I hope that helps because it's a parable we know very well isn't it I hope it helps us to get a bit nearer to its author's intention and therefore to the heart of our God and we'll be helped by that as we seek to serve him faithfully and be fishers of men. Amen.